All right, hello everyone. My name is Ime Code. I'm the Pesthead Program Director at the Xerces Society. Welcome, thank you so much for joining us today um, for Emily May's talk about pesticides and pollinators. Emily May, um, her background is as an entomologist and in pest management. She's been with Xerces for five years and during that time, she has worked across the country with land managers and farmers to really find ecologically sound solutions to pest management and to protect pollinators. So we're really excited to have her um, provide this presentation today. Her talk is gonna be a little over an hour. And uh, after that, we're gonna take questions from folks. If you have a question during the training, there's a little Q&A at the bottom of your, um, of your screen and you can type in a question. We probably won't be able to get to all of the questions but um, we will get to as many as we can. And please reach out to us afterwards if you uh, want follow-up. Thank you so much. Thank you, Emily. Thanks, May. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us. My name is Emily May, like May said, and I'm a pollinator conservation specialist with the pesticide program at the Xerces Society. I'll be talking today about pesticides and pollinators, threats and solutions. We're gonna cover the importance of pollinators briefly, how pesticides pose risk to pollinators, some of the different kinds of high risk pesticides and use scenarios, and then a variety of solutions from changes in your yard and on farms to local policies to protect pollinators. If you missed it, my, my colleague Sharon gave a great webinar last week about that went a little deeper on the ecotoxicology of pesticides and pesticide regulation. Some of you may have joined us for that, but if not, it's available now on the uh, Xerces YouTube channel and has a lot of great information on toxicity beyond what I'm uh, able to cover today. So looking forward to going through this and answering your questions at the end. I know acknowledgements often go at the end of presentations, but I did wanna put this up front to give a special thanks to the Xerces Society members and other supporters that make our work possible and allow us to continue doing on the ground conservation work and educational presentations like this one. So if you aren't familiar with the Xerces Society, we've been around since 1971, uh, working to protect wildlife through the conservation of invertebrates and their habitat. And our name is a reference to the Xerces blue butterfly, which is believed to be the first American butterfly to go extinct due to human development. The Xerces blue lived in the coastal sand dunes around San Francisco. At Xerces, we do a variety of on-the-ground conservation work with programs in pollinators and agricultural biodiversity, programs in endangered species, pesticides, and a relatively new community engagement program focused on urban communities. Some of the most helpful work we do, possibly, is writing very detailed science-based guidance for protecting pollinators and other invertebrates. So if you haven't been to our website, we have free uh, national and regional resources on plants, pollinators, other invertebrates. Um, this is a library of decades of work on protecting the little things that run the world. So please do check it out if you have uh, interest. So just to start off, I know you're probably here because you already care about pollinators, but it's always nice to go through some of the reasons why they're important to our lives. They're very important for natural systems. So pollinators uh, allow wild flowering plants to reproduce and to continue reseeding in their environments. The seeds and fruits that those flowering plants produce are also food for many other kinds of wildlife, from birds to mammals. And through that simple act of moving pollen from flower to flower, pollinators help build out the base of the food chain for many different kinds of species. Pollinators themselves can also be part of that food base. Them, uh, about nine in 10 bird species eat insects as a protein source at some point in their lives. So pound for pound insects actually contain more than twice as much protein as beef. So they're both providing food through seeds and fruits and nuts, and they're providing food themselves. They're also very important for our diets, although for the most part, we aren't consuming them directly but we are benefiting from those seeds, fruits, nuts, and plants that result from pollination. This photo is from a small project that Xerces did with Whole Foods, looking at a typical produce section with all the pollinated foods that we enjoy. I'm actually looking at this again, I'm pretty impressed at the social distancing that I'm seeing in here, even though this was taken a couple of years ago. And this is what that produce section looks like 
without pollinators. So over half of the items in the produce section were removed from the shelves in this project. So our lives would be a lot less colorful. Um, we'd have a lot fewer nutrients on our plates if we did not have pollinators moving pollen around from flower to flower. So who pollinates? Who's responsible for this critical service? There's lots of different animals that visit flowers, usually for nectar, and then end up pollinating those plants. That includes beetles and flies, some vertebrate pollinators like birds and bats, uh, and then of course, bees. Bees are our most important pollinators and they're really what we're thinking about largely through the rest of the, this presentation. We have an amazing diversity of native bees in the United States. There are over 350 species of bees uh, just in my state, Connecticut, and more than 10 times that number of species across the whole country. They range in size from itty bitty tiny bees about the size of a freckle up to those big carpenter bees that get into your sheds. And a lot of them don't look like what you might picture when you think about a bee. If you look at that metallic green sweat bee in the bottom center right. So bees are super important because unlike a lot of the animals that were on that last slide, bees are actively collecting and transporting pollen back to their nest to feed their larvae. They have lots of different special body features for collecting pollen and they're very efficient at it. So if you look at that bee on the top right or on the top left, that's a small sweat bee with pollen that's packed in under her hind legs. Um, so lots of, lots of these bees are collecting this pollen dry and moving it around efficiently from flower to flower. They're also very efficient at handling flowers. Once they've learned how to um, extract pollen very efficiently from one kind of flower, they'll keep going back to that same type of flower over and over again, which is great for pollination because they're bringing that same species of pollen onto the plants they're visiting and actually pollinating them instead of depositing a lot of random pollen from other plant species. Before I get further into talking about pesticides, I wanted to quickly just talk about honeybees, which are probably the first bee that pop into a lot of people's heads when bees fly into a conversation. The European honeybee is a single species. It was brought to America by ship with European colonists, and it's pretty unique. It's a social species. It has this uh, complicated caste system where the, the queen is laying eggs and um, there are sort of castes of workers and nurse bees and foraging bees that are co uh, cooperatively contributing to the colony. It has multiple generations a year that are being laid by the queen. Uh, and then the honeybee, unlike most other bee species, is perennial. So it's overwintering. The, the queen will last several years and the colony overwinters by feeding on its honey stores. Almost all of our native bees um, are annual, so they only live maybe a couple short weeks or, or through the growing season. Honeybees are also managed for crop pollination, so they're living above ground in these hives that can be moved around from place to place. That's very unique um, and, and not the case for our native bees. Most of the more than 3,600 species of native bees are quite different. By and large, we know a lot less about their status than we do about honeybees. The vast majority live below ground in the soil with only these tiny holes to, to give it any sign that they're even there. And the other third lives above ground in tunnels and old snags and pithy plant stems. So keep this in mind when we start talking about um, pesticides in the soil, for example, which might contaminate nests of ground nesting bee species. About 1% of native bees, the bumblebee species, live in small colonies that are in, often in hollow cavities, which could be above or below ground, but are commonly old rodent holes. So why do we need to talk about conservation of these pollinating species? We don't always have monitoring data to say, this species is in decline or that species is in decline. But there is a good amount of evidence suggesting that on the whole, we're seeing declines in abundance of our pollinating species due to many of the same stress factors that threaten other kinds of wildlife. So some of the key risk factors for lots of different kinds of wildlife, including pollinators, falls into the same major buckets, habitat loss and degradation, pesticide use, disease and competition from non-native species, and climate change, 
So I could give full day workshops on every one of these topics, but today we're really just gonna drill down and focus on pesticides as a threat. So what are the threats and what are the risks that they pose? And then what are, we, what are some of the things we can do about it? Pesticide is an umbrella term that includes, but isn't limited to insecticides, fungicides, herbicides, rodenticides, even um, antimicrobials like the Lysol wipes that we're trying to find desperately at this time are technically pesticides. Um, the term pesticide is often misused as a synonym for insecticide, but it's actually a much broader term. Each year in the US, more than a billion pounds of pesticides are applied across gardens, parks, farms, to manage unwanted weeds, insects, diseases, and other pests. But today, the pesticides we're most concerned about in relation to pollinators are insecticides, fungicides, and herbicides, which kill insects, fungi, and weeds, or plants, sorry. <laughs> One reason we're particularly concerned about pesticide use is that the federal process to evaluate pesticides doesn't really adequately consider impacts on native bees and other pollinators. So this next section will be a little bit of review for folks who joined us for last week's webinar that was led by Sharon. Um, so please do check out that presentation if you missed it, which is gonna go deeper than what I'm doing, but we're gonna review a little bit if you were here for that. So in order to protect pollinators from pesticides, we have to think about how they're getting exposed. So there's various exposure pathways that depend on the pesticide itself and how it was applied and where it was applied. Um, but some of the, the main exposure pathways are direct contact, like if a bee is on a flower when a pesticide is applied, indirect contact, uh, where a bee might walk on residue on a, a previously treated plant, contaminated nest sites or materials. So if you, you know, have a bee that's living underground and there's a soil drench application of a pesticide, could contaminate its nest site. Or there's some bees like leafcutter bees. You know, if you've noticed that your roses have little circular cutout holes in them, it could be a leafcutter bee that's bringing that back to uh, paper its nest. So that if it's contaminated would then come into contact with that leafcutter bees developing larvae. Or you could have um, systemic contact. So if, if pesticides are moving into and throughout the plants they're applied to. And the type of bee and its, its behavior, so whether it nests in the soil or above ground, those types of things, those are key to understanding possible exposure routes. When we think about pesticides, we're often thinking about agricultural uses, but they are commonly used in urban areas. There are actually more pesticides used per acre in urban areas than in many agricultural areas. And in our communities, pesticides are often used for cosmetic reasons to maintain manicured landscapes. These pesticides can wash off from grass, patios, other imper impervious surfaces, and end up in our waterways. Um, looking at um, some USGS data, 61% of rivers in agricultural areas and 90% of rivers in urban areas contain pesticides at levels that are risky to aquatic life. So we do need to be thinking about how we can reduce pesticide use in our communities. So just to review, what do I mean when I use the word risk? Risk has a specific meaning, and there are two factors in the risk of a pesticide to any organism, whether it's a human or a bee. The basic equation that uh, comes into risk in assessing risk, um, on one side of that equation is hazard or toxicity, and the other side is exposure. So that's the basic two components of risk. So let's take a non-pesticide example of a great white shark. A great white shark being the hazard in this case, it poses a risk to people who swim in shark infested waters. So sunbathers on the beach are not likely to be exposed to a shark attack. The sun also, taking another example, poses a hazard to beachgoers, but again, the risk is much greater for somebody who's lying out on a beach towel exposed to direct sunlight versus someone sitting under an umbrella. So, we can make choices to limit our risk of shark attack or sunburn, but pollinators often can't change many of the behaviors that lead to them being ex exposed to pesticides. Let's talk a little bit more about the toxicity of pesticides to bees. 
So I'm about to get a little bit into the weeds, but I hope you'll stay with me. And please feel free to ask any questions at the end. Um, so the way that EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, assesses toxicity of pesticides to bees is based on very basic lab testing of adult honeybees. So before a pesticide can be registered, a pesticide manufacturer would be required to submit the results of a variety of different tests, looking at toxicity to birds, mammals, fish, and insects, depending on the expected use of that pesticide. So the standard test animal for insect testing is the honeybee, and the standard test for the honeybee toxicity is acute contact toxicity. What that means in that test, a pesticide would be applied at different doses to the thorax of adult honeybees, similar to what you see in the picture. They are looking for the dose that kills half, 50% of the tested group of adult honeybees over 48 hours. So the smaller the dose that kills half of that um, group of adult honeybees, the lethal dose 50, LD50, uh, the smaller that dose, the more toxic the pesticide is to bees. The EPA then assigns pesticides into three different toxicity groupings based on that testing. So pesticides that have an LD50 below two micrograms per bee are highly toxic. LD50s of two to 11 micrograms per bee, moderately toxic. And anything above 11 micrograms per bee is, are considered, quote, practically non-toxic. And I say, quote, because it's often a misnomer. There are many pesticides that fall into that practically non-toxic category that have toxicity to bees that isn't captured by this standard test. So just keep in mind that EPA's groupings are a very blunt tool for classification. Toxicity falls on a spectrum. So something that has that LD50 of three micrograms per bee, um, but falls into that moderately toxic group, it's still quite toxic. Um, some pesticides fall right on the cusp between these groupings and others have toxicity that really isn't well captured by this test. But it is the main metric that we have to work from for assessing bee toxicity. If you're interested in comparing the toxicity of different pesticides, there's a good resource from the University of California that's called the Bee Precaution Pesticide Ratings Tool. So if you Google Bee Precaution Pesticide Ratings, this will come up. And you can search by product name or active ingredient. An active ingredient is the um, ingredient within the pesticide that is um, contributing the most to its efficacy. So that will give you some information on its toxicity to bees. It will also, where available, have some information about toxicity to larvae and then to other bee species besides the honeybee. So more specifically, how are pesticides toxic to insects? There are many different ways that a chemical might affect an insect and cause harm. So insecticides are intended by their name and nature to kill insects. Mode of action is a term that means the specific way in which a pesticide causes harm or its mechanism. Generally, the most common modes of action for insecticides are those that target the insect nervous system so it's basically these nervous system uh, insecticides are many different ways to achieve the same effect, which is overstimulation of the nervous system leading to paralysis and death. Insecticides that affect the nervous system might mimic a neurotransmitter or bind to uh, and deactivate enzymes that break down neurotransmitters. Either of these things uh, cause signals to continuously pass between nerve cells. Uh, they might bind to ion channels and cell membranes that again cause those cells to fire continuously. So we're going to talk about a few of those nervous system insecticides in a second. Another group though that I wanted to point out is insect growth regulators, which are insecticides that have a mode of action that affects growth and development of insects. They're primarily toxic to developing insects that haven't reached maturity. So some of them are mimicking a hormone that causes insects to molt or shed their skin prematurely. Others affect an insect's ability to synthesize, synthesize chitin, which is the main component of their exoskeleton. So when that insect molts or sheds its shell, it can't properly reform its exoskeleton and dies a kind of an ugly death. The images on the right show molting abnormalities caused by exposure to insect growth regulators in the milkweed bug at the top, and then the cabbage white butterfly at the bottom. So the, the normal pupa is on the bottom and then 
the IGR, insect growth regulator, exposed pupa is right above it. So this is where you can start to see how assessing the risk of pesticides can be complicated. Standard toxicity testing is performed on adult honeybees. Would you expect an adult honeybee to be affected by an insect growth regulator? No, you wouldn't, but you might expect it to have impacts on developing brood. But those impacts wouldn't be reflected in the toxicity classification for insect growth regulators. They're often categorized as reduced risk because they have that low toxicity to adult honeybees captured in the standard test, but that doesn't mean they wouldn't cause harm if bee or other insect larvae are exposed to them. So we do have to account for these impacts when we're trying to protect pollinators from harm. Standard toxicity testing also is really only looking at one outcome, which is death but bees that are exposed to less than a killing dose could have other negative responses. So a sub-lethal effect is anything that is short of death um, that is observed, like decreased growth, changes in behavior, a change in physiology, change in ability to learn or navigate. Many of these different kinds of impact on sub-lethal impacts could reduce an, a bee's ability to reproduce or to provision its offspring with pollen and nectar. And lots of these different small sublethal effects can add up. All right, so before we dive directly into different types of pesticides, let's come back to the concept of risk. So what characteristics make a pesticide risky? So that, that risk assessment is toxicity and exposure. So toxicity is that first part of the equation and then exposure the second. So how long a pesticide persists in the environment, how it moves, so how likely it is, for example, to move from a crop field where it's applied into nearby flowering habitat. And then more broadly, how widespread the use of, of a particular pesticide is. All of these factors contribute to the likelihood of exposure for different pollinators. Let's talk about a few groups of insecticides that are particularly high risk based on these characteristics. So the, the characteristics of toxicity, persistence, movement, and widespread use. I'm gonna try and go through these in an order that's mostly chronological based on when these pesticides were released for use, but it also reflects how commonly these classes are or have been in use. I'm assuming many of you on this webinar have heard about neonicotinoids and how they might be affecting pollinators and I will get to them soon, but that's not where I'm gonna start because neonics are only one of the many types of insecticides on the market and not the only ones that raise concern for bees and other invertebrates. Sometimes I think our focus on neonics leads us to forget about some of the other major insecticide classes. So let's start with organophosphates and carbamates. These are older broad spectrum insecticides, meaning they affect a broad spectrum of different insects. They are insect nervous system, uh, like I mentioned before, common mode of action affects the insect nervous system. And they have, uh, one of the issues with these pesticides is their mode of action isn't limited to insects. So they bind to and inhibit an enzyme that breaks down the neurotransmitter acetylcholine, keeping that electrical signal firing between cells. Acetylcholine is an important neurotransmitter in humans and other animals. And OPs, which is the common shorthand for organophosphates, can result in some human toxicity and a broad suite of poisoning symptoms. The organophosphates, tabin and sarin, are actually some of the most potent nerve gases that have been developed for chemical warfare. So human impacts mean that OPs have been on a slow phase out of some products and uses. Residential home uses were banned in 2001, but there are still many agricultural uses and some are also used for mosquito management. One of the main organophosphates you may have heard of is chlorpyrifos, which is still in very common use despite evidence of uh, that exposure can harm child brain development. In 2016, which is the year of the use map on the right, chlorpyrifos was applied on over 260,000 acres just in California. And there's been a lot of resistance to pulling them off the market. The EPA rejected a petition to ban chlorpyrifos due to clear human health impacts two years ago, citing its importance for agriculture. But we were happily surprised this year when the manufacturer of the most common chlorpyrifos products on the market under the trade name Flores Band 
announced that they would be ceasing production of chlorpyrifos this year. Generic chlorpyrifos will continue to be available for use, but we'll take good news where we can get it. Some of the other common organophosphates you might have heard of include malathion, phosmet, and diazonon. So some of uh, the carbamates have a similar mode of action to organophosphates. They have broad spectrum and activity. They're highly toxic to fish. But unlike organophosphates, they are still in residential use as well as agricultural. So one of the most common is carbaryl, which you might know by the trade name Seven. Carbyl is highly toxic to bees and other beneficial insects. And one of its common uses that we have a lot of concern about is actually not as an insecticide per se, but as a chemical thinner in apples to reduce the load of fruit on the tree and increase the size of the remaining apples. So thinning agents in apple orchards are applied just after bloom and sometimes right at petal fall when there's still bees in the orchard. So that's one of those um, uses that we have concerns about here in terms of protecting pollinators from harm. When we think about risk to pollinators, beneficials, and aquatic invertebrates, we should definitely not get complacent about pyrethroid insecticides. So pyrethroids are the synthetic relatives of pyrethrins, which are organic insecticides that are derived from the chrysanthemum flower. But before you fall for the marketing that these are somehow equivalent to their naturally derived and relatively short-lived um, cousins, pyrethroids are in, in engineered to be more stable and in some cases considerably more persistent in the environment. So pyrethrins, the organic versions, and pyrethroids, the synthetic versions, aren't equivalent. Pyrethroids are broad spectrum insecticides that affect the insect nervous system and are highly toxic to bees on contact. And they are extremely common in both ag and urban settings. They're used on more than 50 million acres of cropland, often as sort of cleanup sprays right before harvest. Bifenthrin is the most common pyrethroid, which is used on over 14 million acres nationally. The map on the right shows the estimated agricultural use of bifenthrin. It's quite common on corn and soy, cotton, and a variety of other crops and it's highly toxic on contact. It was actually detected in a survey of native bees sampled in Northeast Colorado grassland and wheat fields. It was detected in nearly a third of those native bee samples. Pyrethroids are also common in mosquito management. So permethrin is a pyrethroid that's applied on about nine or 10 million acres annually as a mosquito adulticide, which kills adult mosquitoes, which is about a third of all adulticide acreage. So if you're looking to figure out if something's a pyrethroid, many pyrethroids end in thrin. So other common pyrethroids besides bifenthrin are zeta cypermethrin and lambda cyhalothrin, both of which end in thrin. Okay, so that was OPs, carbamates, and pyrethroids. Now let's talk neonicotinoids. I hope I'm not overwhelming you with these pesticide words. Neonicotinoids are widely used in agricultural and urban settings. They were released in the mid 1990s as an alternative to the older organophosphate and carbamate insecticides, many of which at that time were becoming less effective as pest insects developed resistance to them. So neonics were heralded as reduced risk because they are less toxic than those older chemistries to mammals. So neonics, their mode of action is they bind to a neurotransmitter receptor site that's common in insect nervous systems, but not in vertebrates. So they are much less toxic to humans than some of the older ones that are acting on, uh, that have a mode of action that's shared between insects and mammals. Relative toxicity to humans and other mammals is an important thing to keep in mind when we start to push for banning or replacing chemistries. So if we're thinking about banning neonics, what are the alternatives and how might those alternatives impact farm workers and other pesticide applicators? We need to make sure we're thinking about those outcomes as we craft policies. So why have neonics gotten so much coverage? The reason is that they do have a particular combination of characteristics that make them high risk to pollinators and other invertebrates. So looking at them through the lens of the risk equation on the toxicity side, most neonics are highly toxic to bees and many other insects by both contact and oral exposure. And on the exposure side, they also pose real challenges. They are systemic, meaning they dissolve easily in water and move into and through plant tissues. 
and can be expressed in pollen and nectar. So they're persistent. They're also persistent. So sometimes remaining at harmful levels in woody plants and soil for months to years after application. Um, and they're used almost ubiquitously in agriculture. So all of those things together mean that these are particularly high risk to pollinators. This figure on the right shows the increase in neonicotinoid use by crop in the United States over the time period of 92 to 2014. Neonic seed treatments, so applied as sort of a coating on the outside of seeds to protect the young developing plants. Um, those seed treatments were used on close to 100% of corn acres by 2011. And yet the amount of neonics applied to corn still doubled between 2011 and 2014. So they are in extremely widespread use and increasing use. Because they are, uh, so they're water soluble, which is what allows them to be systemic and taken up into plants, they can be quite mobile in soils as well. So neonics applied to crops can contaminate plants in surrounding areas. Um, a lot of times even just by subsurface, like under the soil movement, in water, and they pose risk to bees that visit wild plants in field margins and nearby habitat areas. So taken together, these, the, the high risk potential is why we talk a lot about neonics, but you may think of neonics as these systemic insecticides, but there are in fact a variety of insecticides that fall on a spectrum of systemic activity and could pose some risks to insects that feed on nectar and pollen. So let me overwhelm you with a not comprehensive list of insecticides that fall on this spectrum of systemic activity from locally systemic, this is called translaminar, uh, as pesticides you know, penetrate leaf tissue and are locally available, but generally don't move throughout the plant to fully systemic moving throughout the plant. So I'm not gonna go through all of these, but the insecticides on this slide have systemic activity that goes beyond locally systemic. And feel free to refer back to this slide when it's up on YouTube. One feature to note about these is that the method of application can be really important for how much these insecticides move through a plant. So applying pesticides to soil as a soil drench or injecting them into the trunk of a tree, that's gonna result in greater systemic activity than foliar applications made to leaf surfaces because those foliar applications mean the pesticides are more likely to break down in UV light and they have to penetrate the waxy leaf cuticle to actually get into the plant. So it's much easier for a plant to take up uh, a systemic from its root zone than it is for it to penetrate through that waxy leaf cuticle and get in and move around. So once systemics have been taken up by a plant, they are generally more protected from that UV breakdown and they're more stable. So those trunk injections, for example, or systemics that are otherwise uh, made available in woody plants can persist for longer periods because they're protected from that UV breakdown. Well, I hope this, this broadens your horizons in thinking beyond neonics to the many other chemicals that could be moving in plants, being picked up in pollen and nectar or in leaf tissue. And we are gonna talk about solutions later, but this is one of the reasons we encourage municipalities to think about policies that are broad, broader than simply a ban on neonics alone. I know Sharon did talk about this last week, but I'll mention it again. Just because a pesticide is organic doesn't mean it's non-toxic or that it does not present some risks to pollinators. So, in talking with growers and talking with gardeners, I often hear things like, oh, it's just neem oil. Well, neem oil and its active component, azadiractin, are insect growth regulators. That means they could have impacts on developing larvae. It's organic. Is it safe for insect larvae? No. Bt is another common organic pesticide. It's a soil bacterium that produces crystal proteins that poke holes in insect stomachs, essentially. Different strains of Bt are specific to different groups of insects. And the most common one is a strain that targets Lepidoptera or butterflies and moths. It's practically non-toxic to bees. Is it safe? Not if you're concerned about butterflies. So things to keep in mind. And this, this doesn't mean that organic pest management is on par with conventional pest management. 
With the exception of the heavy metal fungicides like sulfur and copper, most organic pesticides are less stable than their synthetic counterparts and break down more quickly when they're exposed to air and light. So one of the examples I already mentioned is pyrethrins versus pyrethroids. So pyrethrins, which is the organic version that's derived from the chrysanthemum flower, are highly toxic on contact to a broad spectrum of insects, but they're also highly unstable and they break down quickly. So you might hear the synthetic pyrethroids as uh, mentioned as sort of equivalent or naturally derived, but they're actually really not equivalent because they're much more persistent um, and, and last days to weeks longer in the environment. So I could go on a much longer tangent here, but I did want to mention that there are concerns that need to be assessed and addressed when you're thinking about organic pesticides. Let's think about some other things that you might not think about in terms of their risks to insects. So insecticides pose the most obvious dangers to pollinators, but other types of pesticides do present risk. So fungicides, uh, current fungicide use patterns are leading to widespread exposure of bees in both ag and urban landscapes. We talked about systemic insecticides. Many fungicides are also systemic and can be taken up by plants and contaminate pollen and nectar. And part of the concern uh, with fungicides is that some types of fungicides interact synergistically with certain insecticides, meaning that when they uh, are, are exposed together to an insecticide and a fungicide, uh, bees experience greater toxicity. More recent research on fungicides is showing significant risk beyond this synergism. Um, a recent study found fungicides are the strongest predictor of the prevalence of a particular gut pathogen in bumblebees and range contraction in four declining bumblebee species. So the fact that we're seeing harm to bees from fungicides that are listed because of how they uh, come out in standard toxicity testing as practically non-toxic to bees demonstrates some of the challenges with understanding risk. It's not just toxicity classification. So this is in part why we're promoting longer term solutions to reduce the need and reliance on pesticides. This figure is from our fact sheet on how fungicides can affect bees, which you can find on our website if you want to dive deeper on this topic. And what I hope you take away from it is some of just the sheer complexity of interactions that are affecting invertebrate communities. So bees that forage in agricultural and urban landscapes are likely to be exposed to complex mixtures of pesticides. Uh, this past summer, we conducted a milkweed contamination survey in the Central Valley of California, looking at milkweeds in ag land, natural areas, home gardens, retail nurseries. And we found at least one pesticide per sampled milkweed plant, but on average found about nine chemicals per plant and up to 25 chemicals in a retail nursery sample. So some of these pesticides, like fungicides and insecticides that were found together, might interact with each other to synergize toxicity, to increase toxicity jointly. Exposure to insecticides and fungicides may also compromise bees' immune function, making them more susceptible to infection with pathogens or diseases. And in the other direction, infection with pathogens or diseases might actually reduce bees' ability to detoxify pesticides. So it goes both ways. One key aspect underlying a lot of these interactions is bee nutrition. How much flowering habitat are bees able to access and how high quality is that forage? So poor nutrition, whether it's from a lack of diversity in nearby forage or a lack of access to flowering habitat, leads bees to travel farther and spend more energy collecting pollen and nectar. Those can also contribute to poor immune function and make bees more susceptible to pathogens, parasites, and pesticide exposure. So bigger scale drivers like climate change and habitat loss contribute at many scales to poor nutrition and then all these other stressors in bee communities. So finally, one other contributor to that habitat loss and reduced habitat quality is herbicides. Herbicides are used to kill weedy plants or in the case of pre-emergent herbicides, prevent their germination. There's a handful of herbicides that have some lethal impacts on beneficials, such as paraquat. And we're only just beginning to learn more about some of the sublethal impacts of herbicides, like changes to gut microbiomes of honeybees, changes in feeding and navigation behavior, 
but in general, we think the largest impact of herbicides on pollinators is indirect. So herbicides can ne negatively impact a variety of terrestrial wildlife by eliminating habitat, by getting rid of their food sources. Some researchers believe that the declining populations of the monarch butterfly are linked to increasing herbicide use uh, because of the loss of milkweed and nectar plants in and around crop fields. So these are, these are some of the things that we've been thinking about, with herbicides, fungicides, insecticides. Have you had enough doom and gloom? <laughs> Let's turn around and take the second part of this presentation to talk about a positive vision and our, our ideas for solutions. Pollinators really need landscape scale conservation. Only a small fraction of the American landscape is actually uh, undisturbed habitat for plants and animals. So our ultimate goal is to help urban and agricultural areas realize the potential for su successful pollinator conservation through building high quality connected habitat for pollinators and then taking steps to protect that habitat from pesticides. Habitat loss and fragmentation is the leading cause of species extinctions globally, but the good news is that insects are able to exploit very small patches and partial habitats that are suitable for nesting or foraging. So small improvements to habitats can have dramatic results. And the amount of habitat in our landscape directly influences insect diversity and abundance. I could give a whole separate presentation on the specifics of pollinator habitat and how to restore it, but the basics of what habitat provides are flowers, so floral resources or forage that provides pollen and nectar, shelter, so nesting and overwintering sites, and protection from pesticides. Those are the three main components of good pollinator habitat. So how do we address pesticides uh, in our yards, gardens, farms, local communities, up to the federal level. That's the second piece of once you've built habitat, how do you protect it? So there's many changes that can start at home in our yards and gardens and on farms. For those of us who aren't land managers, who don't have yards or gardens, or who aren't using pesticides to begin with, we can start to cast a wider net and think about how we might ag advocate for changes in our towns and cities or at the state level. I'll talk about the Xerces model policy that we've helped pass in dozens of local communities to help outline the steps to building habitat and reducing the risk of pesticides to pollinators. And I'd say all of us have a bit less power to implement change at the federal level, but when changes are made at that high level, they can have sweeping effects. So our federal efforts to advocate for stronger protections for native bees and other pollinators include reaching out to the USDA, EPA, and other federal agencies to ensure that they are fully responding to the risks of pesticides and really comprehensively assessing risk. So protecting pollinators from pesticides isn't just about making sure the product that you buy doesn't have a warning sign about bees. An important first step is not considering pesticides to be the first line of defense if you have an unwanted plant or insect. So especially in yards and gardens, we would love to see elimination of pesticide use that's in response to aesthetic concerns rather than the health of a plant or the loss of a crop. So in, in a lot of cases, these cosmetic issues could be avoided in the first place just by planting the right plants in the right place and by providing habitat for beneficial insects that keep those pest insects at manageable levels. So for, and where cosmetic issues do arise, I have um, New England aster in my front yard that has chrysanthemum lace bugs that turn the lower leaves brown as the season goes on. Sometimes it's maybe just a matter of changing perspective to appreciate the diversity of life that your yard can support. So my aster foliage doesn't look perfect, but those lace bugs also don't threaten what's a really pretty hardy plant. Um, they can enjoy it and I can enjoy them. So the aster flowers are beautiful and covered in bees and butterflies in the late season, even though the, the bottom foliage is a little brown. So a set of principles that can help farmers, gardeners, city park staff, and other land managers think through pest management decisions from a prevention first perspective is integrated pest management. This is gonna be probably quite familiar to some of you, but maybe for others, it's the first time you've heard about integrated pest management. 
So I'm going to take a couple slides to talk about it. So integrated pest management for IPM is a framework that can be applied on farms, but also in cities, in schools, in your backyard, wherever there might be pests that need some kind of management intervention. So let's talk through some of the steps. Step one of IPM is knowledge of the pests that you have and their biology. And this is critical. You might be observing damage on a particular plant, but you don't know what's causing it. So how can you work to prevent the damage if you don't know what the pest is or what its biology is? So the second step is knowing that those pests are present. You can make decisions about how to break their life cycles through preventive measures, which is the very first line of defense. So in a farm context, that might be choosing resistant varieties, timing the planting of crops to avoid pressure from pests, planning out crop rotations, using sanitation and management of alternative hosts. The steps are, are similar in yards and gardens, choosing the right plants for the right place. If something you planted is too stressed out by sun or moisture or other conditions, maybe it's not the right plant for your yard. Or maybe there are steps you can take to break pest cycles that can allow that plant to survive there. Step three, when your crops or backyard plants are already in the ground and there's few preventive steps remaining, this step is all about observing and monitoring pest populations and determining when they might have exceeded the level that actually threatens plant or crop health. On farms, this is typically an economic damage threshold where pest damage begins to result in crop losses. And in crops, this is where local university extension resources can be critically important. So setting economic thresholds for a particular pest in your crop and region. Step four, when monitoring shows that a pest has exceeded that threshold, that's when you might be able to intervene um, and take action on the pest. The key part of these economic thresholds for pesticide reduction is actually what happens before that threshold is met. It encourages managers to tolerate, tolerate some damage when they might otherwise wanted to intervene the first time they saw a bug out of fear of crop loss. In yards and gardens, there aren't really economic thresholds, which is why we lean harder on reduction of pesticide use in these urban environments for cosmetic uses. So that brings us to step five, which is just evaluation and planning, thinking about your next season in your garden, what worked, what didn't, why. This is how IPM is continually refined over time, particularly in crops and regions where there are resources for IPM research and an active research and extension community. Prevention is the foundation of successful IPM and it's why we emphasize this as a strategy for reducing reliance on pesticides. By taking out food, water, or shelter for pests and making sure your plants are as healthy and well-nourished as possible so that they can help defend themselves, you can prevent pest populations from reaching outbreak levels. I'm not sure my mom ever said this, but maybe yours did. An ounce of prevention saves a pound of cure. So this can go a long way to, to save on costs, actually. Examples of preventive strategies include planting the right plants in the right place, building healthy soils, and protecting biodiversity. Building on top of that are cultural control methods. So the integration of integrated pest management is integrating cultural, mechanical, and biological controls. Cultural controls reduce pest survival, reproduction, and establishment. Um, due to enhancement of desired conditions. So examples are like making sure plants are getting appropriate irrigation and nutrients and pruning out infested foliage. Mechanical control uses physical methods or mechanical equipment to remove or exclude pests. So that's things like mowing or hand removing insects, hand weeding, using mulch or barriers and traps. Biological controls in this particular hierarchy refers to augmentative biocontrol or the introduction of natural enemies of target pests. So some of those are like certain lady beetles or lacewings are commercially produced and can be purchased and released for pest control. But I, I could go into this further, but don't have time. Introduction of these non-native or commercially produced organisms carries risk and needs to be thoroughly assessed before consideration, which is why it's higher up on this pyramid. Um, conservation biological control, which is referring to building up 
local populations of natural enemies by enhancing habitat. That's part of the prevention foundation of IPM, the base of the pyramid. And then up at the tippy top of our IPM pyramid is chemical controls, which are the last result, resort and only when a pest has exceeded an economic threshold and other strategies have been exhausted. Pest issues that do emerge are often the symptom of a problem rather than the problem itself. So often pests are affecting plants that are already stressed or where we've accidentally created conditions that help pests thrive. So rather than treating the pest itself, we're trying to identify the underlying issue and make changes. This is where early intervention is important. If you notice something is diseased, cut it out and dispose of it in a way that minimizes its spread to the rest of the plant. So an example would be powder, powdery mildew, which affects a lot of different garden plants. I have it on my, actually I have it on my bee balm. Um, it's likely to come back if you treat it with a pesticide. So the key is actually taking away the conditions that allow powdery mildew to survive, which might be insufficient airflow or overwatering or even over fertilization. So knowing what your plants need um, and what your pests are needing to survive can help you identify the best way to address those. As you manage your habitat, you focus on preventing rather than treating. The steps we've gone through to create pollinator habitat will help you create a resilient and diverse ecosystem that emphasizes native plant species that are likely to hopefully build in beneficial insects that help you with that pest control. Uh, including that variety of plants will reduce the threat of pest infestations that could affect the entire planting. Only about 2% of insect species are pests and most of the rest are beneficial in some way. So if you're seeing damage on your plants, that could actually be a good thing because it means insects are using your habitat. Something's eating your milkweed, that is awesome. Look closely, hopefully it's monarch caterpillars. Many insects that eat or parasitize pests will also use that diverse habitat that you plant. This is what I mentioned before, conservation biocontrol, attracting species that prey on pests in your habitat. Learning to recognize and promote these natural enemies can help prevent pests from becoming a problem. So some of the common ones you might find include assassin bugs, minute pirate bugs, lacewings, predatory wasps, ground beetles. There's good pocket ID resources on beneficial insects in many areas. This might be a good opportunity to go out and learn how to identify some of the common beneficial species in your area. Um, I would recommend checking out your local university extension to see what they have um, as far as information on those. So let's come back briefly and, and look at an example of using the IPM framework in your backyard. So my Monarda, which is bee balm, it's a great pollinator plant. It was having trouble flowering the first couple of years after I planted it. The buds were getting deformed and there wasn't an obvious pest present. So what did I do? I observed carefully. So that's step one of IPM. You might be observing damage, but you don't know what's causing it. So how can you work to prevent the damage if you don't know what the pest is or its biology? So when I looked closely, there was frass or insect poop present on the deformed flower heads. So I did know it was an insect but I wasn't seeing the culprit itself. And I Googled it and looked for pictures of similar damage and characteristics. This is actually a photo from Reddit of someone who had the exact same problem. Um, I might have been able to call my state entomologist or local extension for help. Um, and it does help that I have an entomology background, but a lot of times you could Google um, general descriptors of damage or, or insects and, and get to the resources that you need. So it turns out that I had a horse mint caterpillar outbreak that probably came in with the plants that I'd bought. The caterpillars were eating the flower buds before they could turn into flowers and produce the nectar that attracts bees, butterflies, hummingbirds, and more to my yard. So what could I do to interrupt, oops, excuse me, the damage, um, interrupt this insect's life cycle to reduce the damage I was seeing on these plants, which are important contributors to the overall quality of my yard for pollinators. So the strategy I went for was thinking about removing food and shelter for the insect. So I ended up plucking the flower heads that showed frass from caterpillars, leaving only the flower heads that didn't show signs of infestation. I bagged them up and threw them out. 
On a farm, this is what we would call sanitation, which is the same principle here, but on a smaller scale. And the results I was looking for, so one of the things ahead of time is just setting goals. What results was I looking for? Uh, I don't think a bug-free garden is a healthy garden, but in this case, the horse mint caterpillars were so severely reducing Monarda flower production that they were removing it as a food source for all the other bugs in my yard. So my goal was to reduce their population to a level where the plant could start to produce flowers again. And so after a year of removal of infested buds, the damage was much less pronounced the next year. And then I did a little bit of light bud removal the second year. And now the horse mint caterpillar population seems like it's at a level that my Monarda can sustain. So it worked. That's the evaluation and monitoring. The principles of IPM are something that can be implemented in many different environments, from city parks to schools, greenhouses, nurseries, forests, natural areas. So part of our work is to help all of those folks implement prevention first IPM and think about non-chemical practices that address the root of their pest issues. If you're interested in, in learning more, we did just put out a new fact sheet on smarter pest management for cities and college campuses using IPM principles which is available on our website. So in a well-executed IPM framework, a farmer or a city parks manager would only apply pesticides as a last resort when preventive measures are inadequate. And the pest is at a level that threatens economic objectives. But it is also unrealistic to think we're gonna eliminate all pesticide use. So we have to also be thinking about mitigation strategies that reduce both sides of the risk equation, toxicity and exposure for pollinators when pesticides are used. So where pesticides are used, we're thinking about how to mitigate risk to pollinators uh, by reducing toxicity and exposure. So avoiding use of highly toxic pesticides and high risk use scenarios like tank, mis tank mixes of pesticides that increase toxicity when they're applied together Many of these high risk scenarios are addressed in our guidance on protecting habitat from pesticide contamination, which is a fact sheet that's also available on our website. On the exposure side, uh, reducing exposure can happen by treating only the area needed. So for example, by spot spraying or limiting treatment to just the area where it's needed. So we work with growers to help site pollinator habitat physically away from areas that will be treated with pesticides and otherwise protect that habitat from contamination. But we also recommend taking all possible steps to minimize drift and offsite movement that can contaminate nearby habitat. So not allowing pesticides to uh, drift onto flowering habitat and other resources like streams. So this is the last uh, part of the mitigating risk, and then we'll move into our last section on our model policy for towns and cities. But as I just said, one of the things that we deal with at Xerces is figuring out how to make sure we're creating high quality habitat that's protected from pesticide contamination. The best option is to plant habitat physically away from treated fields. And that guidance that I mentioned on protecting habitat from pesticide contamination includes recommendations for spatial buffers or sort of setbacks around pollinator habitat based on the type of application equipment with a larger buffer for highly mobile insecticides like neonicotinoids. But those numbers aren't hard and fast and they might not be cautious enough for some scenarios. Spatial buffers can also be difficult when the only space available to you is right next to an area that's being treated with pesticides, whether it's a crop field, or a golf course or a town park. You cannot always change what your neighbor's doing, even if we all probably have a thing or two to say about it. So where physical distance isn't possible, vegetative barriers or buffers consisting of non-flowering woody plants that can capture above and below ground pesticide movement um, and or deep rooted native grasses for that below ground movement, those can all help protect pollinator plantings when they're planted between the habitat and the site that's being treated with pesticides. So just to say again, these, these sort of drift capture vegetative barriers should be planted with species that aren't attractive to pollinators because they're gonna be the ones capturing and taking up the contamination. 
All right, so all of those things were strategies you could use as an individual or a land manager to voluntarily put an emphasis on prevention and reduce reliance on pesticides and then mitigate risk to pollinators where pesticides are used. But how could you encourage others to change their behaviors? So one place to start in your communities is the model policy that we've developed after working with many communities to develop frameworks for protecting pollinators. And it actually, it goes beyond pesticides, it's addressing two of the key threats we've been talking about today, which is the need for forage and nesting habitat, and then reducing the potential for harmful pesticide exposures. The policy also incorporates um, some in public engagement. Um, so it, it, it includes three main sections, the first of which is a commitment to restore and create habitat with a focus on identifying opportunities on city properties and promoting connectivity between habitats. And then it's a pesticide section, which includes prohibiting use of highly toxic systemic insecticides on city land, and then a commitment to following the principles of integrated pest management to reduce reliance on pesticide use. And then the final piece is a commitment to engaging the broader community in the steps the city pledges to take to support pollinators. So how can you make this or some kind of similar policy happen in your community? A good first step is reaching out to a city council member or a county commissioner that you think might support the effort. Explain the issue, talk to them about it, ask if they might help lead the policy through the political process. You could share our example policy to show them what you're looking to accomplish. Talk to the city parks department. Other ideas might include reaching out to state departments of transportation or utility companies that might be supportive of incorporating pollinator friendly management in their operations. Social media is a great way to get the word out about your policy and other pollinator conservation efforts. Posting to local groups on a platform like Facebook, Twitter, or even Nextdoor can help others learn about and get involved in advocacy efforts. You could even uh, write a letter to the editor in the local paper. Or, or write a full article to contact the local newspaper and say, hey, I'll write an article about this and how you can conserve pollinators in your community. And then finally, if you want your community to help bring back the pollinators, we are here to help. Xerces staff can help meet with the parks department to discuss ways to incorporate pollinator protection into parks management. We can help elected officials craft policies, write letters of support, review testimony, or just take time to meet with interested people to explain the value of the policies. So that's part of what we're here for. And I know this presentation has ranged over a variety of topics, and I know it started out with a lot of doom and gloom. So I just wanted to end it with a quick meditation on our team's philosophy of change. So our vision is one I hope that many of you share, a future where all landscapes, towns and cities, farms and natural areas can enjoy thriving, diverse and abundant invertebrate populations. This will take solutions at all scales, including both voluntary changes on the parts of individuals, gardeners, farmers and other land managers, as well as regulatory solutions that can lead to broader change. And we've talked a little bit about both of these solutions today. Our work is guided by science, but also the precautionary principle. So taking preventive action in the face of uncertainty, shifting the burden of proof to the proponents of an activity, in this case, pesticide manufacturers, and exploring a wide range of alternatives to possibly harmful actions. Pesticides are and can be a challenging arena to work in. There's strong feelings on all sides. So in our work, we're doing our best to meet people where they are and then encouraging them to move outside their comfort zone to achieve conservation goals. Implementing alternative strategies for managing pests can feel like a big ask. It's a big step outside of a comfort zone, especially when crop yields and profit margins are at risk. But the long-term payoff can be greater ecological and farm worker health, so we will keep asking. Most of our work is through outreach like this webinar, often in co collaboration with other Xerces teams. Building solid relationships and working together to find feasible solutions is often the deepest and greatest and most rewarding change. So we hope you take this to heart as you work in your own communities to conserve and protect pollinators. <laughs>
So with that, I will take questions. Thanks so much for participating in today's webinar. Great, thank you, Emily, for that. I really appreciate it. Um, we've had quite a few great questions come in here, so I'm gonna do my best to ask a few that were um, asked multiple times. So uh, one that I'll start with is we've had quite a few questions about um, yard treatments for ticks. Could you speak a little bit about um, how those could impact pollinators and also what other strategies might be for tick management in particular? Yeah, I can talk a little bit about that. So there's a lot of different products that are used for backyard tick management, um, some of which are things like pyrethroids uh, that I talked about earlier, and others of which are more sort of repellents like the essential oil products. Um, the broader spectrum insecticide uses for tick management can have a variety of negative impacts. Um, and I, I would say I don't recommend those for backyard tick management. Um, one of the things that we have been looking into a bit more are, um, are bait tubes and bait boxes, which sort of interrupt one part of the um, life cycle of uh, ticks and, and Lyme disease in particular, um, which treats mice actually. Um, so the, the rodents go into these bait tubes and then they get treated with a bit of permethrin, um, which is a, a, a pyrethroid, and then they, they bring it back um, on their fur to their nests. When, but it affects the ticks that are on their, uh, on their bodies. But it's a much lower exposure than broadcasting pyrethroids across an entire backyard. Um, so in terms of mitigating risks, that's a better strategy than doing a broadcast application. Up here in the Northeast, um, where I'm based in Connecticut, one of the things we talk about for tick management is actually just cultural management of certain invasive species. In if you're, for example, your house backs up to a wooded area that has Japanese barberry, which is an important actually piece in the life cycle of Lyme disease and ticks in the Northeast. So removal of Japanese barberry can reduce Lyme disease incidence in your local tick population. Um, so one thing to look into if you're in a wooded area that has barberry. Um, and then finally, you know, just thinking about personal protective equipment and, and making sure that you're, you're wearing long sleeves and doing your tick checks. Um, but I think, it, you know, these, these pyrethroid applications in particular have uh, lots of consequences, both for um, the people and animals that are living in those spaces, as well as the invertebrates around them. Great, thank you. We've also had a couple questions about um, buffer sizes between areas that might be being treated for pesticides and uh, pollinator okay. habitat. Can you speak a little bit about some of the different options of for buffering? Yeah, and that's, uh, you know, I kept it a little vague on that slide about buffers because it, it really is context dependent. Um, the numbers that we have used, um, they're, they're somewhat dependent on context, but the numbers we have used are 40 feet for ground-based tractor applied um, applications of pesticides, 60 feet for air blast applications, which are like what you would see with an orchard sprayer, um, and then over 125 feet for highly mobile neonics uh, applications, including you know, row crops that are planted with coated treated seeds. Um, and that's just based on sort of what we can see in the limited literature available on how far these things are moving and what levels might compromise the health of pollinators foraging on nearby habitat. Um, it's going to change a little bit depending on whether your habitat is downwind or downslope of the treated area um, or upslope. Um, and again, if you have limited space available and you can't change your neighbor's practices or implement a setback, um, that's when you, you might want to be looking at some kind of, you know, like a conifer, a row of conifers or another sort of vegetative barrier. Great, thank you. Um, we've also had a couple questions about mosquito management. So I'm just going to go ahead and mention that we do have a number of mosquito management resources, including a new fact sheet available on our website. So if you search on Xerxes for mosquitoes, um, you should be able to find those resources there. Um, I actually, I do have a slide on that if you're, if you'd like to know more about mosquito management. I figured that would be a question today. So I included one extra slide that I didn't have time for in my hour long presentation. But mosquito management, um, 
Insecticides are the default method of mosquito control across millions of acres of wetland in the United States, and there are millions of pounds of pesticides applied every year for their control. So some of them are products that kill the adult mosquitoes and others are larvicides, which kill the immature form of the insects. Um, and the most commonly used ones are organophosphate, adulticides are organophosphates and pyrethroids, which we talked about. And those have broad spectrum toxicity and have been implicated in some declines of wildlife near treated areas. Um, so when we talk about how we can do more ecologically sound mosquito management, like Sarah said, we have some great resources on this on the website, but it's a lot of the same steps that you uh, might have uh, picked up on through prevention-based IPM. So monitoring and prevention are sort of the key steps to um, uh, ecologically sound mosquito management, starting with removal of source habitat or that stand stagnant water that is breeding habitat for mosquitoes. And then monitoring. Um, there are 100, 175 species of mosquitoes in the United States. The vast majority of those do not vector disease. So local governments can monitor to determine if there is a risk of disease transmission from local mosquitoes or not. Um, so individuals and governments can contribute to the source habitat removal as well. So standing water in garbage cans, bird baths, flower pots, old tires, etc. And then where disease-causing mosquitoes are present, early intervention with targeted use of products that uh, kill mosquito larvae can prevent the use of those broad spectrum, broadly toxic adulticides, which are the last resort in mosquito management. And then just like with ticks, part of the reduction in disease risk is just personal protection. So wearing long sleeves when mosquitoes are active, using repellent, keeping your screens in good repair. So a little common sense goes a long way in mosquito management. Great, thank you for that. Hopefully that addressed quite a few of the questions on mosquito management. And again, do take a look at our website for more information there. Um, we also had a couple questions about herbicide use to manage uh, invasive plants or in natural areas. Could you speak about um, some of the considerations when thinking about managing in natural areas or removing um, invasive plants? Sure. Yeah, I get this question a lot. Um, and, and sometimes herbicides are the only tool for, for managing some of the most difficult uh, invasive species, which are preventing you from having a you know, diverse native plant community in a particular area. Um, what I would recommend is looking at any, you know, if there are cultural or mechanical methods for removing those plants, look at those first. But if herbicides are, are really the only um, tool available to you, thinking about ways you can apply them that um, reduce exposure. So things like basal bark treatments, cut stump treatments, um, spot spraying for removal. Um, you know, I don't, I don't want us to get into scenarios where, you know, we're, we're broadcast spraying herbicides every single year to take care of an uh, uh, invasive plant community that's, that's really not going to go away, not going to be able to be eradicated or contained um, because that, that seems like long-term folly. But in some cases that herbicide use, um, a little bit of herbicide use can lead to longer-term plant diversity um, and a, a better plant community to support invertebrates and other wildlife. So um, whenever you, know, you can reduce exposure in their use, um, keeping in mind that sort of cost benefit. Great, thank you. Um, so one question here about fungicides. Um, are fungicides categorized in terms of their impact to pollinators or specifically bees in terms of lethal or sublethal impacts at all? Um, well, I mean, what we have for fungicides is the same thing we have for insecticides, which is that standard toxicity testing of adult honeybees. Um, and so it doesn't give us a, a great picture of how those fungicides are interacting with other pesticides and that cocktail that bees are experiencing on the landscape. So I would say, no. We have, though, that really blunt, how toxic are they on contact to adult honeybees? And you can find that um, at that bee precaution pesticide ratings tool that I mentioned early on, um, the UC, the University of California IPM uh, site. So you can go in and search and it'll tell you sort of broadly whether it's um, moderately toxic or practically non-toxic. And then it also will give you some 
idea of what insecticide those particular fungicides might synergize. But in general, we don't have like a comprehensive tool for, um, for ranking toxicity risk of fungicides by sublethal effects in particular. Great, thank you for that. Um, we have a question here about how someone can get help from Xerxes in educating their city and residents about the issues we've been discussing today. Um, can you, do you know what the email is, Sarah, for our pesticides team? Um, great question. I believe it is pesticides. Um, I think it's just pesticides at xerxes.org. Or you can check on our pesticide website and there should be a link to contact us. So that's a great way to get, um, get in touch with us. And we're happy to help cities out with reviewing plans, with um, developing and implementing a local policy based on the one that Emily mentioned that we have available um, and, and other uh, assistance with developing policy and outreach. Okay, and then we also have a question of um, about toxicity testing on adult honeybees and how um, if there are any plans or changes in place to include more species or uh, additional toxicity testing when pesticides are registered. Um, May, if you're on the call, would you um, be willing to respond to that question? I am on the call and I was just reviewing questions and I missed what it was. <laughs> Sorry, could you repeat that? Sure. Yeah. Somebody asked about um, kind of toxicity testing being done on adult honeybees and the impacts of this, um, and if there are kind of any plans to shift away to other bee species or using, uh, you know, sub-adults or anything like that. So definitely our, the US EPA has a complex regulatory structure around when various tests are, are implemented. And the first step is that, you know, that look that, that Emily May spoke about, which is that LD50 lethal dose to adult honeybees. There are a number of other tests that have recently been approved to look at larval honeybees, also to look at mason bees, which is a solitary bee, or at bumblebees. So we are creating standards around those other tests for other species. Um, but, the re but right now, those are not required. And so what basically that honeybee lethality test is what we have across the board for all chemicals. And then when a chemical is being registered or reviewed for continuing registration, other tests might be added if there is a potential concern noted by the, re the chemical review manager. Um, that and so I hope that helps. It's it, there is definitely progress in that area, but it is not across the board, and we definitely don't have the uh, uh, the big picture. I think that's one of the reasons that Xerxes feels it's really important to lean to the side of caution when when we're making decisions because we know there is always uncertainty, and the reality is there always will be uncertainty. No matter how many tests are done, there's going to be uncertainty. We need to be aware of that and take that into consideration as we make our conservation choices. Thanks, Ray. You know, there was another question that I was hoping we might ask, and since I'm off mute, um, someone asked about why we don't promote all organic instead of just IPM. And we work with a lot of organic growers and absolutely support organic systems. Uh, some of, you know, the most amazing diversity in insects and you know, an ability to watch how conservation biological control can, can support a farm is happening on our organic farms. But Xerxes also realizes that the vast majority of farmers that are out there are not organic. And if we really do want to be able to reach a broad swath and a broad sector of our agricultural community, and therefore we do try to work with conventional growers, seeing where they are now, and taking those steps to move them towards more conservation-minded actions. Um, so I hope that, yeah, I just wanted to make sure that question got answered too. Thanks. Thanks, May. Great, thank you, May and Emily. Um,
See. One question, um, and this is maybe a little bit more specific to an agricultural um, situation, but one question we've got here is about buffer strips for pollinators. Um, and curious kind of what our take is on that in agricultural fields. Uh, it looks like this question's probably coming from the Midwest. So that's a, that, do you wanna answer, Amay? I'm happy to also. It's okay, I just, it's such a, it's such a difficult question to answer. Um, because of all the, you know, the variables you were mentioning before, but yeah, feel free, go for it. Okay, um, well, so there's the context, I think in part for this is there is a, um, under the USDA Natural Resource Conservation Service, which um, leads conservation programs on the ground, um, there's a new practice called uh, contour buffer prairie strips, which are um, essentially, contour buffers are, are strips of vegetation in farm fields um, or at the foot slope of farm fields that catch water and nutrient runoff before it can enter waterways, which improves water quality. Um, it's, it's a practice for improving soil erosion. And the recent addition to the program is incorporating uh, prairie plants into those buffer strips for an added benefit of biodiversity. Um, so, you know, there are, there are definitely concerns about implementing biodiverse strips um, in especially fields that are being planted with coated seeds, with neonic treated seeds, um, because there is a substantial at this point growing amount of evidence that neonics can move from the, tr the crop fields where they're applied into nearby habitats um, and contaminate pollen and nectar and leaves of those plants. Um, so I'd say we are concerned about strips where they are being planted uh, with prairie plants, flowering plants in farm fields that are treated or at the foot slope of fields that are treated with pesticides and treated seeds. Um, but there, there is also evidence that once a field has been taken out of neonic treated seeds, um, that those plants are no longer at risk of contamination after about two years. So um, in fields where those, you know, where they aren't being treated, um, we'd, we'd be very happy to see prairie strips go in because they have obvious benefits um, for, for both soil erosion, water quality, as well as other biodiversity benefits. But yeah, we do want to see those protected from pesticide contamination. Great. Thank you, Emily. I know that's a complicated um, situation. Um, we've had a couple questions as well about lawn products, especially weed and feed and fertilizers and those potential impacts. Um, on, on uh, ecosystems in, in folks' yards? Um, so I don't, I don't know weed and seed in particular. Um, in terms of fertilizer, I mean, the main, the main impacts when fertilizers are particularly over-applied is the runoff into water systems and then the buildup of, you know, phosphorus and nitrogen that leads to the blooms of algae and other things in our, in our waterways. Um, so, you know, I think in general, we would like to see, um, management of, of lawns go a little bit, um, uh, less manicured and more towards promotion of native plants and biodiversity and, um, and maybe worrying a little less about how, um, green and lovely and unweedy they are. You know, just to add a couple of pieces, I totally agree if we can, um, change that aesthetic to recognize my, my lawn right now has a bunch of native violets in it and it's utterly beautiful, I think. Um, but when we think about weed and feed, a lot of those weed and feeds also now include an insecticide as well for grub control. And so one we're gonna be, you know, as Emily May mentioned, we've got fertilizer concerns and runoff. We've got herbicides and the, and the concerns that they might have we're gonna be, you know, knocking down if you want to have any other diversity in your in your grass other than grasses and have flowers you wouldn't be able to and then you're going to be potentially looking at an insecticide that could be harmful to grubs uh, and other other larvae in your lawn there's actually some recent looks and you know we're, we've been working on issues with fireflies and thinking about um, the impact that insecticide use in lawns is going to have on firefly populations as well so talking to your neighbor about 
trying to diversify uh, their lawn to have more floral resources, making sure that they're not putting insecticides down for grub control, and really, again, getting back to the root causes. A lot of times there's grubs if you don't have sufficient um, water flow and aeration, thinking about what it is that you can do to keep your lawn healthy without having to revert to really just addressing the symptoms with, with a weed and feed or insecticide. Great, thank you for that. Um, we have one question here about whether or not regulations require testing for pesticide effects that move up through the food chain. And we had a couple other questions about the um, impacts of species that are higher on the food chain that may be consuming um, either bugs or plants that have been treated with pesticides. So I can, I can speak to the effects on the food web, but may I think I'll turn it over to you for any further regulation and testing questions. Um, you know, one of the things that we're seeing with neonicotinoids is um, that they do move up the food chain. Um, and, and partly that may be just loss of that base, uh, that base of the food web are caterpillars. So caterpillars are a super important protein source, as I mentioned, for birds. Um, you know, a, a single breeding pair of chickadees needs something like 9,000 caterpillars to feed a, a clutch of young. Um, so when caterpillars are impacted at the base level or other insects are impacted at the base level by an insecticide, um, that does um, move its way up the food web. Um, not so much in the same way um, as we saw back in the day with DDT and sort of the bioaccumulation that led to consequences for raptors and other birds, um, but, but just in, in even the loss of a food source. Um, but we are seeing you know, impacts on birds and other wildlife uh, from consumption of treated seeds to loss of, of, of their food resources in a variety of, of studies that are coming out from the US and from Europe. I mean, I don't know if you wanted to, to talk about the uh, food chain part of the regulation question. And I'm, and you know, I know that with Endangered Species Act, when you look at pesticide regulations and um, evaluations for their impact on endangered species, the threshold or the, the, it's more rigorous. And so under Endangered Species Act, if you have a listed species, there are, they do consider indirect effects as well as direct effects. So an indirect effect would be, for example, the loss of a food source. And slightly different than up the food chain, but those other effects that could impact a species are considered within that. I am not coming up with what might happen under the standard federal pesticide regulatory structure uh, for dealing with food chain effects. I don't know if Sharon has anything she could add, um, but yeah. I, I, I can jump in on that really quick. There are some tests that, that check for um, what they call bioconcentration or bioaccumulation. Um, sometimes some pesticides get concentrated by certain um, organisms. And so there are occasionally tests required by EPA to test that, um, for instance, for mollusks, um, oysters, there's an oyster bioconcentration test and it, and it looks at the concentration of um, pesticides that might be present in the aquatic environment and how much that concentrates inside the body of an oyster. Many tests are um, sort of optional and EPA could decide whether or not they will require a test like that depending upon how the chemical is going to be used um, and some of what's already known about it. So. It's, it's not necessarily that you would have that kind of um, sort of food chain perspective on every single chemical that is proposed for registration. Great, thank you, Sharon, Emily, and Amay for that. We are at 11.30 and have addressed quite a few questions here. So I apologize if we didn't get a chance to get to yours, um, but it is time to um, move on and end the webinar. So thank you everyone for participating and for um, tuning in today. Again, if you missed it or want to send it on to friends, it'll be available online at our YouTube channel, um, probably later tomorrow or early next week. And we hope to see you for another webinar soon.